I'm Bridget Bardot, for all you know, your girl behind the counter. And for all those in the know, one of y'all is gonna be in a bear costume by the end of this, and you're gonna have to decide amongst yourselves who. So let me know in the comments section which one of you will be the ritual sacrifices. Anyways, we're gonna be talking about Ari Aster's Midsummer. So before we get started, let's put on a little bit of background with the relationship between horror and the dark. Horror is historically kind of a cheap genre. It's not cheap in its content. Like, I run a horror channel. I don't think horror movies are like, ooh, bad movies. But typically horror projects are not given a massive budget. And the way that a lot of horror movies will try to hide their budgetary constraints is through darkness. When in doubt, throw it in the dark and hope that nobody sees it. A great example of this is Nightmare on Elm Street, where they did not like the practical effects for some of the scenes. And for the scenes that they didn't like the practical effects in, they just turned down the saturation so that you couldn't see how bad it actually was. And that works for a lot of people, but not for everyone. So there's a subgenre of horror called day horror. A great example of this is Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is horror that is set in the day. And let me tell you, light brings out a lot of stuff. You can't cheat out a lot of things when there's a giant light shining on it. And while I think that Texas Chainsaw is a great example of day horror, Midsummer is one of the only horror movies I've ever seen that does light horror. Horror that is enhanced through excessive or just incredibly bright and overpowering light. And before we even get started on the light stuff, why don't we talk about what the heck Midsummer's about? So we followed three anthropologists, Mark, Christian, and Josh. Christian has a girlfriend whose name is Danny, and unfortunately at the beginning of the film, something awful happens to Danny. It is so awful, if I discuss it on the channel, I will likely be demonetized, but we'll just leave it at pretty bad. And she's rightfully pretty depressed, which is incredibly inconvenient for Christian because he just wants to dump her already and just move on. And he really wants to dump her before a trip with his friend Pele and his other bros to Hargasingland, home of the Harga in Sweden for an authentic midsummer ceremony with a bunch of authentic Swedish people. So, you know, he's hoping that Danny won't want to go on this trip, but unfortunately she loves him more than she likes herself and decides, why don't we all just go together? And he's like, uh, when they arrive, to the festivities, they are given some magic mushrooms and start going and doing some festivities. And everything's going well up into extreme cliff diving, as I'm going to call it. Some very extreme, extreme sports. And people are well, devastated, because these extreme sports tend to be a little bit lethal. Of course, Danny is horrified, but the anthropologists are not. So as Danny goes and runs back to the cabin where she's been staying and starts like crying horrifyingly, Pele's like, no, 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 it's fine. It's not that big of a deal. Like they really like doing this, I swear. And She's like, well, I guess I'm stuck here. And then suddenly all their friends start disappearing. So eventually it's just Danny and Christian left and they get very acclimated with the Harka as Christian is given an opportunity he uh, can't refuse that just makes me go, cause it's gross. And Danny thrives as the May Queen as she beats all the other Harga to win the position. As Christian gets incredibly jealous of Danny, he then decides to uh, take the opportunity he cannot refuse. And Danny finds out. She watches him do it and she is devastated. And then when given the opportunity to either A, 
please the Midsummer Gods by provide by killing a Harga person, or please the Midsummer Gods by going and murdering her own boyfriend in a bear costume made out of actual bear. She chooses her boyfriend and then lives happily ever after. The end. So before we discuss the thematic relevance of this all, let's discuss how they do it. I think the best thing about Midsummer is the inherently bright palette is built into the script. So they're gonna be at Sweden, top, top of the equator, top of the equator, where they're going to be celebrating Midsummer, which is the summer solstice festival, which takes place on some of the brightest days of the year. Now, because they are on top of that equator, light and darkness come are a lot more extreme there. So inherently, it's set during this time where there's going to be nothing but daylight. And that's inherently disorienting, especially if you've ever been on a long distance flight going internationally, waking up when it's, you know, supposed to be midnight in your neck of the woods and it's like two in the afternoon in their neck of the woods is actually quite a jarring feeling. What time is it? It's 9 p.m. What do you mean? But in addition, there are also bright costumes used. So the Harga are donned completely in white with some primary colors kind of accentuating it. And because they're in white, every single bit of light is going to bounce off of them, creating even more disorientation because you're watching bright stuff and looking at bright stuff. And then there's bright set design, not only from the setting that they're actually in with the wildflowers and the trees and the grass and how naturey it is, but also the fact that most of the buildings are either white or blue or yellow, which all bounce light right off of that stuff. And finally, I have a feeling they oversaturate this color palette in post, but I wouldn't 100% quote me on that. But all of these things come together to create both a euphoric and disorienting effect, which just makes you wonder, what the hell is even going on here? Okay, so I swear to God, this all has relative significance. I'm building up to something, I promise. So one of the most interesting things about the Midsummer Ceremony is that it is inherently when the Harga are the most honest with themselves and the most dishonest with other people. So they're the most honest with themselves because they're doing the ceremony of their people and rehashing life events which have been done for thousands of years, which uh, given the reaction of the general public is kind of a no-no in the rest of the world. And also they're the most inherently dishonest because somebody's got to get in that bear costume, okay? Like they need to sacrifice someone and they're, no one's gonna really be very willing in terms of sacrificing themselves. <laughs> But when they do their honesty, it's bathed in light. For example, the extreme clip jumping is bathed in light and is one of the brightest scenes of the entire film. When the offer is discussed of Christian, the woman who's talking to him, spotlight on her. And also when all of the girls are becoming the May Queen, bathed in light. It's incredibly bright, it's incredibly disorienting, and it's right in the middle of the day. But whenever the Harga are uh, lying to people, they're doing it in the dark. So Pele starts going and sowing dissent between Danny and Christian in the shaded area of the sleeping quarters. Let's see, they're murdering people largely at night. And when the little girl who is, you know, supposed to be bequeathed to Christian tries out her manipulation of him through the rune. It's in the middle of the night. But it's not just the Harga who are the most honest in the light. The 
this extends to the anthropologists as well. So starting with how they lie to themselves, Christian tries to steal Josh's thesis statement while inside the barn where they sleep. Josh tries to decimate the entire Harga culture single-handedly in the pitch black of night. And when all three of those guys are telling Danny to her face that, no, we, we like you so much, you're so great, it's in the middle of the dark in their dorm room. But they have to be honest when bathed in light. So when Christian is going and cheating on his girlfriend, the spotlight is all on him. In addition, when Mark uh, of the anthropology department decides to pee on the ancestor tree, big no-no in, I guess, studying other people's cultures, gun in light. And finally, when Josh decides to inherently like let this extreme cliff diving happen and not try to save anyone, it's in the light. When the anthropologists are dishonest with themselves, they have to be dishonest with themselves in the dark. But the light cuts away all that crap. But you wanna know who really thrives in the light? It's Danny. She starts out this movie in the dark, dealing with the worst things that have ever happened to her. When she takes the magic mushrooms, it's daylight. When she becomes the May Queen, she is bathed in sunlight and gets to do all of her duties in the middle of the day. And finally, when she burns her boyfriend, she does so in the middle of the daylight, witnessing fire. And what is fire? But the concentration of light. And I think this not only has to do with honesty and being honest with yourself, but it has a lot to do with anthropology. I believe this is a film about honesty, but I think this is more of a film about honest anthropology and the relationship between film and honest anthropology. Because it's not a coincidence that they chose this as the reason they go to Sweden, okay? It's not an arbitrary choice. They kind of bring it up a lot. The best anthropologist in here is ironically the one with no training in it. It's Danny. So she's actually the most successful at doing what Josh, Mark, and Christian want. Danny manages to honor and respect the culture without bothering them. And when confronted with some of the more harrowing aspects of it, she actually treats it with a fair amount of respect and just goes, well, I don't necessarily know these guys, but let me go talk to the other people in my group about this experience and make sure they feel okay. She empathizes both with the people who are watching it, but also with the people who are conducting this ceremony. And she understands that she's a guest. And once she's cool with it and is not a nuisance with them, they let her in. She is invited with the Harga women to make cakes with them. She is then invited into the very central May girl ceremony where they all dance around the pole and she becomes the May queen. And then she gets to participate even further as she gets to lead them as a guest and then participate in the final ritual, truly actively. And that makes her a pretty successful anthropologist who's observing and interacting with the culture respectfully. But the people who die tend to be very dishonest anthropologists because despite claiming that they really care about these people and they really care about going and representing them accurately, boy, they put themselves in the entirety of focus for the Harga. They are not neutral observers. Not only do you have Christian trying to go and win their good graces, you have Josh trying to go take a picture of their holy text for clout, mostly for clout, so that he can get one in over Christian, but you also have Mark who literally pees on the Harga tree of ancestors, which is a big no-no and then asks, I mean, what's even the big deal about this? Despite thinking that they are really good anthropologists who really understand this, they're really bad at this. They're not honest 
with themselves. And I think that goes into the nature of film and anthropology itself. A film that I think goes way more explicitly into this than Midsummer really would dip its toes into is Cannibal Holocaust. Because Cannibal Holocaust came at a very specific time. So this movie is about a bunch of people who go into the jungle, meet a cannibal tribe, and pretend to be like filmmakers who want to go and record them for anthropological purposes and get killed by the tribe. But what this movie is a critique of is the Mondo film. So the Mondo film is a form of not the most ethical documentary filmmaking. So Mondo films are shockumentaries or sometimes they're exploitation documentaries. But what they are is a compilation of clips for scientific purposes, oh, not really, that are designed to titillate an audience. So stuff having to do with nudity, stuff having to do with violence against animals, which is typically unsimulated, simulated violence against people, reenactments as they call it, and also actual instances of real violence against people recorded, not always with people's permission, and then sold to a different audience, to a film-going audience, and presented as fact, real, despite not having any context and not always being real. But I think one of the less like horrible examples of this in terms of like graphicness is Nanook of the North, one of the first documentaries ever created. Nanook of the North follows a Inuit person named Nanook, and well, some of the stuff in Nanook, Nanook of the North is real, a lot of it isn't. Like, it really isn't real. Uh, they, they got a bunch of like Inuit actors to just perform stuff arbitrarily. And as a result, Everyone believed it was real, and it's not. And it's very irresponsible to be passing off things that are biased and unreal as fact. And a documentary that specifically goes into the Nook of the North is Angry and Nook, which goes into the consequences of how the documentary filmmaker, the terrible anthropologist, if you will, painted that society and the lasting damage that it took on as a result. And I think Midsummer, despite being a horror film about a girl who puts her boyfriend in a bear costume and lights him on fire, it's a lot more about film's representation with anthropology and with presenting things that are not true as 100% true and the selfishness and dishonesty and self-delusion that goes into it rather than just a straight horror film. I think it's a little bit more critical of film than we think. Anyways, I'm Bridget Bardot for all you know, your girl behind the counter, and I talk about movies you don't give a shit about, like comment and subscribe for even more movies you don't give a shit about. And of course, follow me on Instagram where I'm at official girl behind the counter and Letterboxd where I am Bardot for all you know, and I'll see you in the next one, counter crew.